The world of business is becoming ever more dynamic. The rising flood of information comes with more complexity and less transparency. At the same time, customers want more for less. Companies have to manage complex and fast-changing processes, supported by technologies which deliver more than just speed. Let's take a look at your back office. How do you manage the increasing flood of unstructured information and ensure fast and reliable customer communication? Intelligent automation is the key to manage these challenges. It can automatically classify and manage all incoming information. This enables faster and better communication with your customers, leading to excellent customer satisfaction. Intelligent automation is the key to your success. By automating your processes, you can reduce repetitive tasks and make better use of the creativity of your staff. And there's more. Intelligent automation is easy and fast to implement. Works 24 hours all days. Works with no changes to existing systems. And fosters continuous improvement through machine learning. The use of intelligent automation is the key to your success. Swiss Post Solutions can take you there. We connect the physical and the digital worlds. Okay, we're going to continue now with our keynote speakers, and we're going to talk about the digital revolution in document management, combining the physical and the digital worlds. Please give a warm welcome of applause to the CEO of Swiss Post Solutions, Mr. Jörg Vollmer. Brian, thank you. You're welcome. So, geschätzte Damen, meine Herren, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure for me to be here today and to share some of my thoughts around digitalization and more specifically about digitalization in the area of document management. The fourth industrial revolution is considered to be a fundamental shift in how we produce products and services, how we consume, as well as how we relate to one another. This was as well the main topic at the World Economic Forum at the beginning of the year in Davos. And what has been discussed is twofold. On one hand side, the big opportunities new technology bring to us, but what was discussed as well is the impact on the society and the labor market. And we are still in process to understand what it really means when human work and artificial work converge together. And it's not really the first time we are seeing big changes uh, in the history. I think the first industrial revolutions, as you all know, was uh, the invention of the Watt steam engine, when mankind moved away from relying on the power of horses and other animals towards uh, mechanical power. Second industrial revolutions happened at the late 19th and uh, early 20th century with the invention of the mass production like the Ford assembly line. And the third industrial revolution, this is actually what you all know, that happened over the last half century with the invention of computers in production areas, CNC machines, in business environment, ERP systems and uh, PCs. So what is a fourth industrial revolution all about? Well, we don't know exactly yet. But what is very obvious, it will be a, around a broader range of topics and will happen at a much faster pace as what we have ever seen before. So let me give you some examples for the mega trends which will change the world. First one, around electromobility. I think there's no way around electromobility anymore. Total cost of ownership for an electro car, according to experts, will be lower than for an automotor pretty soon. They so talk about 12 months or less. So that means that most of you, when you buy a new car in the next couple of years, will uh, decide for an electro engine. And I learned yesterday as well that the German Bundesregierung 
has a plan to get one million more electric cars on the streets here in Germany by 2020. So some uh, 950,000 to go in the next four years, so this certainly is a challenge, but I think the, the plan is in place. And we see a similar trend with electric cars, for example. And uh, we also see that with uh, um, self-driving cars. And when we talk about autonomous cars, when you look at your own car, there are so many assistance systems already in there, whether it is a navigation system, whether it is front, side, rear assist, all of these things already from a technology perspective are there. You all have seen the famous Google cars in California, no steering wheel anymore, no brake pedal. And what you see here actually <coughs> is a, the post-auto prototype, which you can visit live these days in Switzerland, in Siong. So this is already in live service, actually these are two, and carrying people and visitors around the city. So these things are already going on. Next topic, 3D printing. I think this is really a powerful technology as well. And I'm not thinking about printing rabbits, even if we are close to Eastern. I'm not thinking about printing Lego blocks or toys. I'm really thinking about value add. Think about a surgery, for example, where a part during the heart operation is missing and you can print that on demand. So this is where real value comes into the play. And uh, another good example is what the NASA is doing. So they brought a 3D printer into, into the International Space Station. And instead of bringing in hundreds of tools, bringing it up to the universe, they are now printing tools on demand as needed for the many experiments. And last not but, but not least, and most important for us in business process management, is intelligent automation. And these are exactly the topics you have heard already about this morning, artificial intelligence, robotics process automation, and uh, I will come uh, to more details on this um, in a second. So what all of these technologies have in common is that they further develop at an enormous speed, an exponential speed. And this is really hard to understand for our human brain. So our traditional thinking is based on survival instincts and on linear patterns. For example, if we build one house per day, then in 30 days we can build how many houses? 30, exactly right. This is what we learned in the last 20, 30, 40 years since we started school, but uh, exponential development is different. And uh, this shows this example here. So if you put one grain of rice on the first field and double it with every second field, then you have two, then you have four, you have eight. And the questions for the accountants, what do we have in the lower right corner here? How many grains of rice? Any accountants here in the room? Exactly 128. Who said that? So 128. So if you go to the first cross in the third line, guess how many grains of rice we have over there? I tell you, it's already more than 1 million. And if you go to the upper right corner, the chess field H8, this is 922 trillion grains of rice. A huge number. You would need 150 billion trucks to carry it away. So this is exponential growth, and there's also a good message with that. We are still in the lower half of the chessboard here. And the second half of the match is still open. And this is what is most interesting for our future. I therefore think it's an important assumption as well, that the fourth industrial revolution is happening at a must, much faster pace and a pace we have never seen before. And we have seen 
digital champions in the last couple of years already. Think about Apple. The iPhone was invented in 2007, and this made Apple the most valuable company already in 2011. At that point in time, replacing Exxon. Today, they are par and par with uh, Alphabet, a digital company as well, with a similar development. Think about Uber. Of course, you all know Uber doesn't own any assets, they don't have any cars. But what's interesting as well is in New York City, they had a market share last year, Q1 2015, of 9%. This year, Q1, they are at 30%. And the remaining market is split between taxis and rental cars. And regardless, if you plan a stay, private stay abroad or plan a business conference, there's probably no way around Uber, uh, around Airbnb anymore. Two years ago, I did not recognize Airbnb on the market for this kind of services. Today, they are everywhere around. So these trends, of course, also impact Swiss Post. And with 60,000 employees in Switzerland and uh, around the world, Swiss Post is the third largest company in Switzerland. The business is pretty diverse. On the Post Auto, where we have 2,500 buses in public transportation in Switzerland. On the right-hand side, we have a bank, Post Finance, with 3 million customers in a country with 8 million inhabitants quite a significant uh, number. And last week, we announced our 2015 results with around 8 billion Swiss francs in revenues and a good and solid 10% profit margin. In the classical mail market, I think these are stable revenues, similar in logistics. The challenge here is really around uh, efficiency increase, in order to add value for the customers. Not to do this the traditional business, but to deliver a package, for example, also to a train station, to an airport, in the evening and uh, over the weekend. So these are things driven by digitalization. And last but not least, Swiss Post Solutions, the area I'm responsible for, with 7,000 people around the world, we deliver document management services. So, and what are the services about? So, that starts in the lower left corner, physical services. So, we run 450 mail rooms all around the world, in New York, in Singapore. The biggest, actually, is for one client here in Germany, where we serve 45,000 employees on one going emails. Step into digitalization. The next step with the digital is an early scanning of the digital documents via work for an electronic archive. So this is really a paperless office to our clients and a key reference in the UK, a plan to build a house, a new headquarters, up with building it with 14 floors. So talk about price per page or price per scan page. These are the real business case organization um, can provide. But this is also one step in between. Most data are included in what we call processing, where we extract the data from the documents and capture the information. And this for structure OCR technology, for example, is something which exists for a couple of capture from, from and uh, this is uh, really a we are running, and we have one insurance company uh, we, who gets uh, approximately 1,000 emails with master data changes, able to read these documents, right? There's no form sheet in between, and read attachments, PDF, Word, cluster that we have a light of pro 3%. Right? To get the documents, uh, uh, do the data made that must. And when documents get out of the document output processing, this is also where we 
uh, provide multiple channels. Of course, physical print is one thing, but it's also about email, email with PDF attachments, secure email solutions. We have a solution called IncaMail, uh, which really securely delivers information. For example, when you talk about pay slips, this is where this is most appropriate and, uh, um, and big companies are using that. And the last thing, of course, business process and output is also if you own the data, if you have the data. What's important to see as well is a development in document processing and business processing. A couple of years ago, we all started with on-site, onshore delivery, 100% manual work. Then we have seen a trend towards labor arbitrage, going to Eastern Europe, nearshore, going to Asia, offshore, but still doing the manual work, even more manual work because even the tools used in the past were not appropriate anymore. This was complemented by BPM software, OCR software, I mentioned already. And this is still what we consider as best in class today, what you see on the left side of this slide here. But looking ahead, new technologies will come. And uh, robotics process automation is the first one which is already ready for production, I would say. And, uh, this is actually automating standardized, repetitive tasks human beings are doing today. So if you imagine in finance and accounting, in bookkeeping, for example, when people log on on a screen to a system, take an amount from an Excel worksheet, put it into SAP, wait for the end of the transaction, the result will be put into SharePoint. So these are typical tasks which can be automated today. And the good thing really is that this can be automated pretty fast. This doesn't require big ERP implementation programs. So implementation time is between three and six months for robotics process automation, and we can go through the human interface. So if you see the cursor on the screen, if the robot, robot is working, it looks exactly the same as if a human being is doing uh, this kind of work. The next trend is artificial intelligence. So it's a little bit um, um, ahead uh, than cognitive computing, but artificial intelligence is reading unstructured data. And this is a real value, and uh, I already gave you the example for that. And cognitive computing in some time, I don't know whether it is three years or four or five years, with the Watsons of the world and the Amelia systems, this is also recognizing voice. And this will have a big impact, certainly, on the call center environment. So all of that is still ahead of us, but I think it's now the time to consider that, and companies, large enterprises, think about robotics process automation and artificial intelligence. And if you don't, uh, do, don't do that yet in your company, maybe it's an opportunity to look into that. And as I mentioned already, what could be done with ERP systems has been done already. So every company has an SAP in Oracle system, has a CRM system, has a business uh, process management software in place. So these efficiencies have been lifted already. And uh, I don't think with the next SAP release there will be significant improvements over here. But what has not been addressed yet is really the long tail of automation. The many projects, the many process improvement projects going on in operations. And this is really what we want to address here with intelligent automation. This is not going through the chain of command of the CIO. It doesn't require 
a big IT budget. It doesn't require three or four years to implement it. This can be done really uh, in operations with a short implementation time and with a, a core focus on, on the processes here. And if we round it up, what the value drivers are, ah, here we have an example, okay. We even, but it's not working. <laughs> so I think if we round it up completely uh, with uh, value drivers in business process outsourcing, I often get the question from clients, um, what can you do differently than what we can do in our enterprise? And it starts with economies of scale. So economies of scale certainly allow for industrialized production methods. And uh, to give you an example, when we talk about document input, scanning, capturing, data extraction, we process one billion uh, documents at Swisspo Solutions around the world. So one billion documents are 1,000 trucks full of paper. When we talk about document processing outbound, so printing, we even are around 1.5 billion in terms of pages. But economies of scale is only one factor. Economies of location are still very important, right? You need to do the work where it makes most sense. In Switzerland, we have uh, tough regulations on data security, especially in the banking industry. This allows only for onshore delivery, and automation plays a big role. But I think a solid nearshore component, especially if languages in Europe are required, or an offshore component is also mandatory to really gain the economies here. Operational excellence, very important topic as well. We are also, we are very often talking about efficiency, but don't have really the tools how to improve it. So Lean Sigma methods, Kaizen methods, on a regular basis, really in, in, in an industrialized environment are important. And I'm always fascinated when I visit our offshore center in Vietnam with 1,500 employees, how far we develop this continuous improvement processes. And when talking about Vietnam, this is probably an offshore location you are not very familiar with. In my business life, I opened and built a lot of shared service centers, whether it is in Eastern Europe or in Asia. Um, Vietnam is a place which is uh, um, known for very much process-driven process people, good education, uh, the labor costs are comparable to India, attrition rate somewhere between 15 and 20 percent, and the language availability due to the cultural development um, is very good. So you find French, for example, over there, due to relationship to Eastern Germany in the past, the German language is very much in common in Vietnam. So this is certainly a good place to be. I talked about technology enablement. Uh, I talked about digitalization, intelligent automation, robotics, artificial intelligence. This is something we had on the radar screen already for the last 10 years. But I think it's now the time really to leverage the advantages of the technology. This was not possible a couple of years ago, and the main efficiency gains, if we look 10 years back, were driven by labor arbitrage. And last but not least, we also have the leverage across many clients. What we develop for Swiss Post internally, what we develop for other clients, this, of course, can be leveraged as well for the next client. And I think this is certainly a big advantage in business process outsourcing. Not to reinvent the wheel, not to pay uh, money to learn. I think we have learned a lot in the last couple of years and well, as well, and uh, 
um, pay the bill also on our own. Customer performance objectives have changed in the last years as well. I think cost reduction certainly is an important topic. Otherwise, nobody is thinking about business process outsourcing. But more and more in the interaction with our clients, we see that people are looking for a partner to master the challenge of the digital transformation. To have a reliable partner and not to um, give away processes as is and get the same back in five years. It's really the development and also the power um, to invest in solid solutions. And the software solutions we see today on the market may not be the same in two years and may not be the same in five years. And it's always a combination. I think that's very important as well. It's a combination of automation and human beings. So if you ask me for the vision for the next couple of years, it will be really the combination having people in the country, having people near shore, offshore, and a big portion of automation giving us the efficiency gains we need to make our numbers. With that, I'm coming to an end. I'm not sure if we still have two or three minutes for Q&A, so, but uh, as long as we have this time, let's do that. But first of all, thank you very much for listening, um, and then we move to Q&A. We have one question. Yeah, we've got, we got one time. If you want one question, we've got time yeah? for one question. Sure. Okay, good. Go ahead. Yeah, fine. Yep. If you could stand, we get the microphone to the person back there. There we go. Hello. My name is... Is it working? Yes. Yeah. My name is Daniel Dierix. I am uh, a business finder for big American companies. By the way, outstanding presentation. Exceptional. One question. When do you think artificial intelligence will play a role? And will it ever exist? I think it does exist already. I've seen it in the area of document management, right? Reading and capturing unstructured data. So it does exist. We have uh, uh, clients live with the technology already. We are going into pilots almost every day. And I think this will be really the exponential development we have seen on the chessboard. So I'm not sure when it is really fully kicking in. Hopefully, we are the first ones and leverage that trend uh, compared to others. But I'm pretty convinced if we meet here next year again, or in two years, that we talk about big, big references. And I also can tell you, all big clients, whether it is banks, insurance, insurances, are thinking about it. Yeah, yeah. So cognitive computing, next level, and the Watson systems, and the Amelia's from IPsoft, and so on, I think this will take more time. This is probably, if you ask me, something we discuss in three or five years. Hello, uh, Aki Anastasiu from South Africa. Um, just to clarify, did you say 8 billion turnover in 2015 and a 10% profit? Yeah, Swiss Post overall. Is that francs or dollars? Swiss francs. Swiss yeah. francs, okay. Yeah. The other it's the same these days. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's almost the same. Uh, the question I have for you is your bus service that you have, how are you looking at the automation of that service with uh, regard to self-driving cars that are just around the corner 10 years away? Is that something that you're looking at experimenting and investing in on self-driving buses uh, within your organization? Exactly. So... I think the portfolio of Swiss Post is very diverse. We are in the mobility market, right? And we actually, yes, we invest in this new uh, in, in technology. And uh, yeah, we, we, we try it. And uh, these buses, they are self-driving. That's a driver in there for security reasons, but not stepping in, right? But they are fully autonomous already. And they are carrying passengers through the city. Something to visit. If you come to Switzerland, this is certainly one of the, of the big things you have to see. Okay, Mr. Palmer, thank you very much. Let's give him a round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a nice day. That was good. Thank you. We appreciate thank you. it. Thank you.